Well, hello everyone. Uh, Jeff Swinehart with Lancaster Farmland Trust. I want to welcome welcome you to this week's webinar, which is Protecting Farmland 101: uh, How Does a Conservation Easement Work? Um, if you're not familiar with Lancaster Farmland Trust, we're a private nonprofit organization preserving and stewarding uh, the beautiful, rich, productive farmland uh, of Lancaster County. Um, we have uh, quite a few uh, attendees on today's webinar with interest in this particular topic. Uh, if this is your first webinar, thank you for attending. If you're returning, um, and, and we have a few folks that have been to every webinar that we've hosted, which is very exciting for us to, to see that level of interest. Um, but if you're new, welcome. And if you come back, thank you again for, for your interest uh, in the work that the trust is doing. Uh, today, Jeb Musser, our Director of Land Protection, will be presenting on the topic. Uh, and just a few a few reminders before um, Jeb kicks off the webinar here is you can ask a question in the chat or the question panel at any time. Um, at the end, we will have an opportunity for question and answers. Uh, also, the webinar will be recorded, and you can find the recording of the webinar on our YouTube page. A link will be sent late, later, later today. Uh, and then also on our YouTube page, you can find our past uh, recordings of those webinars. And we are looking for recommendations on topics. Actually, today's topic uh, was recommended by a few past uh, attendees with some interest in this particular issue. Um, being our conservation easement and, and how does it work and how does it protect uh, farms and farmland. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Jeb and he'll lead us through the, the presentation. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so as Jeff mentioned, we're going to uh, try to, in an hour, uh, cover what exactly is a conservation easement and what does it accomplish and how is it structured and things like that. Um, so uh, we're going to keep it pretty high level, but obviously if you ever think of any specific questions, we'll have that period at the end. And then you can always email myself or Jeff or reach out to someone at, at uh, our organization and we can have a, a longer conversation about it. So what we're going to cover today, I'm going to start off just kind of um, setting a baseline on what, what is an easement in general. Um, and then get into conservation easements specifically. So we're going to talk about establishing objectives for conservation easements. What are the key elements of Lancaster Farmland Trust's model or template conservation easement? And then, like I mentioned, some time for questions at the end, hopefully. So jot down your questions as, as we uh, go along here in the chat, and we'll cover them then. So uh, what is an easement? So kind of a legalese definition, and for those of you who are on one of our webinars before, we covered this a little bit, um, but an easement is the right to use the real property of another person or, or whoever owns a property for a specific, for a specific purpose. Um, the easement itself is a real property interest, but the legal title to the underlying land is retained by that original owner for all other purposes. So. Um, you're acquiring a legal um, interest in the property, but you're not taking over ownership. The, the property is still owned and managed otherwise by that landowner. Some examples you might be familiar with are utility easements, so power lines or pipelines or sewer lines or um, things like that that may come across even one of your properties where the utility company is utilizing your property to have their um, certain utility cross your land. Um, while you, um, in, in a case of an easement, aren't giving up ownership of that land, they're able to use it for that purpose. Um, it's a little bit different. In some cases, you see power lines, uh, PPL may actually take ownership of a strip of land, and that, that, that's a little bit different, that they actually own that underlying land, but the, in a lot of cases, it's, it's an easement or, or right-of-way or something like that. Um, you see private easements. So, um, some of you may, maybe your neighbor has a, um, a, pr a private sewer um, and they needed to cross your property with their sewer line. Or um, I was reading in preparation for this uh, webinar, I was reading an article about um, kind of a solar view shed easement in which a neighbor had um, solar panels on their property 
and then there was an easement placed on the neighboring property basically that that landowner couldn't construct um, structures of a certain height that would block the sunlight out so i thought that was an interesting one access easement so obviously if, you, if there's a landlocked parcel maybe behind your property and your neighbor needs to um, construct a, a driveway across it in order to access their, their land that, that is a pretty common example probably have heard of trail easement so if there's a, tra a hiking trail or, or anything like that that may, can, may come through a property not in every case is that trail actually um, owned by whoever maintains that trail but likely there, there may be an easement saying that that the holder of that easement has permission to uh, manage and operate that trail across your property. And then what we're going to focus on today and what Lancaster Farmland Trust uses to preserve farmland are conservation easements. So a conservation easement is, um, so it's, it's the right to use someone else's property basically for achieving conservation values and protecting conservation values. So it's a voluntary legal agreement between the landowner and a land trust or a government agency that permanently limits the use of that land in order to protect those values. As with other easements, landowners retain many of their rights, including the land to, including the right to own and use the land, um, sell it, pass it on to their heirs, and, and otherwise just use it in ways that are, that are permitted within the easement. So conservation easements, must, in order to be a conservation easement by definition, they must also provide some public benefit, um, whether that be uh, they're protecting or improving water quality. Um, as as uh, you'll see with ours, we kind of cover a couple of these. Um, they could be protecting, preserving farm and ranch land, scenic views, protecting wildlife habitat, outdoor recreational uses, maybe have some educational pr uh, purposes in there, and also uh, historic preservation. So you see that a lot of times with uh, historic buildings. Um, there's plenty of those in Lancaster County. Some of those may even have some sort of historic uh, preservation easements on them. So who can hold a conservation easement? Like I mentioned, a nonprofit conservation organization being Lancaster Farmland Trust you may have heard of some other uh, nonprofit conservation organizations out there, Natural Lands Trust, um, Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, uh, Lancaster Conservancy. There, there are, uh, there's many land trusts across the United States, um, and Lancaster Farmland Trust is, is just uh, just one of many. And also, uh, units of government can can hold those conservation easements. So, um, kind of our quote unquote sister organization um, that also does farmland preservation in Lancaster County would be the Lancaster County Ag Preserve Board. So they're a government organization that places um, easements on farms similarly to that Lancaster Farmland Trust does. Um, according to the, to the um, National Conservation Easement Database, there are estimated four, 40 million acres under conservation easement in the United States. Uh, I know that's a big number, but uh, the United States is a big country, so that represents about 1.65% of the total acreage of the U.S. So while it's a great chunk of land, a lot of acres, obviously there's still plenty of, plenty of uh, work to do if our goal is to protect as much land as possible. And this graph here uh, is also from the National Conservation Easement Database, uh, just shows kind of the breakdown of those total acres under easement you can see that that the majority of those easements are held by by non-governmental organizations like Lancaster Farmland Trust, and then there are some state and some federal easements, local government, um, and then it kind of breaks down from there. Um, so I'm going to put a couple of resources up here for anyone who wants to do a little bit more research on easements that are out there, um, maybe ones that. Uh, of land trust or organizations that are doing other types of land protection that might may be different than Lancaster Farmland Trust. You can certainly feel free to check out some of these organizations if you want to gather some more information on those. Um, land Trust Alliance, that is our, for anyone who's familiar with uh, the land trust world, there's, there's a, um, 
a push for land trusts to be accredited agencies. It, it sets some standards for land trusts we're able, um, and requirements that we have to abide by in order to kind of make sure we're uh, doing the best job we can. Land Trust Alliance is really is that governing agency. They kind of oversee all land trust work um, and, and, and give, give us some good guidance. So they're a good resource. And then Pennsylvania has its own land trust association, uh, does a lot of similar work. Uh, actually, our template easement that we utilize was crafted by the Pennsylvania Land Trust Association in, in conjunction with uh, uh, Pregman Law, which is outside of Philadelphia. So they're a good resource. And then and a couple of the figures and facts that I had came from the National Conservation Easement Database. They have lots of kind of neat maps and charts and things like that. So if you were starting a land trust uh, today and you wanted to uh, begin with um, uh, creating your own easement, where would you start? So you would first want to ex uh, establish what, what, what are we try trying to achieve with these easements we're going to place on properties? What, what objectives do we want to have in our conservation easements? Like I, like I outlined before, it could be a wide variety of things. It could be wildlife, wildlife protection, habitat protection, uh, scenic views, open space, agriculture. So that's kind of the first thing you want to do. And there are many options. This is from the Pennsylvania Land Trust Association Conservation Easements 101. Many different options you could go with, maintain improve, and improve water quality, protect natural habitat, prevent loss and depletion of soil, scenic views, or prevent erosion and flooding, flooding downstream. Um, you kind of get the picture here. So what uh, are Lancaster Farmland Trust, what are the objectives that we set forth in our conservation easement? Um, so we have five main ones. Obviously, the first one I think most folks think of um, is agricultural resources. It's in our name, Lancaster Farmland Trust. Um, so that's that's obviously um, <clears throat> one of the, the first one of five that, that we list out in our easement. So, but there are kind of other resources that oftentimes are present on farms and oftentimes important um, to protect. So agricultural resources, so those high class. If you're on our webinar last week, we highlighted some some farms that had some class one, class two uh, soils, the kind of the, the the best soils in Pennsylvania for farming. We want to protect those. We want to make sure those are are staying in place on the farm. We want to uh, make sure those are open and available for future farming. Uh, scenic resources. So um, I think when a lot of folks think of Lancaster County they're thinking of kind of those uh, open views of farm fields and some kind of iconic uh, farmsteads with the house and the silo and the dairy barn and things like that. We're also uh, playing our part in protecting those scenic views too because uh, it drives a lot of uh, tourism to Lancaster County. There's a lot of uh, folks who come to Lancaster for sightseeing, come to um, check out the countryside. Um, so we, we play our part in making sure that those view sheds are protected. Water, water resources. So um, a couple of weeks ago, we covered water quality projects on farms. I showed some maps of streams in Lancaster County. You're pretty hard pressed to find uh, too many farms in Lancaster County that don't have a stream flowing directly through them. Um, and if they don't, you know, the neighbor probably has one. So um, it's important for us to also protect the water resources on farms too. The, the, um, the wet, if there are wetland areas, the stream corridor themselves, um, and then obviously also the water that runs off of the farm too. Biological resources. So every farm is a little bit different. Some farms have large tracts of woodland. If they're a hundred acre farm, they might have you know maybe ten or twenty acres of woods. There are certainly lots of habitat opportunities, habitat protection opportunities there. Um, so we're protecting biological resources in, in our easements as well. And then ecosystem services, kind of everything in, in nature and in agriculture kind of works together and, and our easement is helping to make sure that that, that cycle is not broken. So those are the five conservation objectives that our easement is accomplishing. accomplishing. And, and if you were to read the document, uh, we um, 
we list those right at the beginning. So it's clear to anybody who's who's pulling a in one of our easement documents that what our goals are. So it's it's great to list what your goals are. We want to protect agricultural values. We want to protect water resources. But really a key component of, of a conservation easement and any easement really is, <clears throat> well, how are you going to do that? What, what specific steps or what specific restrictions are you going to place on that particular piece of land that's going to achieve those objectives that you set forth? And we do that through establishing what we call restrictive covenants. So they are, as their name might suggest, specific restrictions or permissions to support those conservation objectives. Maintain and improve water quality, protect natural habitat, those ones I listed out before. Um, and it really depends on what your objective, objectives are. They, the objectives really drive what, what end up going in your restrictive covenants. So how do we establish ours? So if you remember our five um, uh, conservation objectives, we have to include some language in there to support those. So we start off by um, our staff in conjunction with our attorney. We, ha we have a template that we're constantly updating with new language as it, as it comes to um, as it comes to head when it comes to um, conservation easement law, we always are updating our template to make sure Lancaster are farmland trust and our landowners are in the best position, adding if, there's a, if there was a court case related to a conservation easement that came out, we're always kind of tweaking our language to make sure everyone's in the best position. But from that, we start with a template document. We're, ne we're never starting um, from scratch anytime that we are meeting with a landowner. We, we, have, we have a template document and that document includes both things that we're going to require to be in there um, on every piece of property we preserve. And then there are also some things that can be flexible and can be negotiated with landowners. So it, while it's important to start with a template document, as it, it, land trusts are afforded the ability to be a little bit flexible with that document because each property is unique, each landowner is unique, um, and and really, um, you want to be able to tailor this document to make sure you're you're achieving the best possible outcome. But with that, we established kind of minimum baseline requirements of of things we like to see in our our easement or kind of rules of thumb. Um, and we and from there, we we have the ability to negotiate certain restrictions with those landowners. One of those might be an exclusion area. So. In the example of a 100 acre farm, um, maybe the landowner has a, a pretty large scale commercial operation operating um, on one side of the farm where um, it's, it's beyond a sideline business that you might see on a typical farm. There's lots of traffic coming in and out of there. Um, it's pretty clear from the outsider's perspective that that's a commercial operation. It doesn't necessarily blend in with the rest of the farm. We have the ability to exclude that piece of land from the conservation easement area. It gives us the ability to preserve the rest of the land while not um, overly restricting that particular area. And the landowner can still own and operate that area as they wish, and it would have no restrictions from our end. That's, that's one option that we see um, on occasion. The landowner might want to exclude area for that. They may want to exclude an area that they plan on selling off in the future, and they don't want the, it, the, the subdivision to be restricted by the easement. Secondly, and we'll get into these areas later, um, our easement establishes kind of different tiers of protection areas based off of the land use on a farm, the highest standard and minimal protection areas. Where those areas are located, um, that's a conversation that we have with with the landowner before before the farm is preserved. What areas do you do you see as the the most uh, the the most the areas on your property where you don't want anything to change in the future that might go in a highest protection area? And again, we'll get into this a little bit later, but that's something that can be negotiated prior to when the easement is recorded. So all these negotiations, keep in mind, these are happening prior to the farm being preserved. Once the farm's preserved. It's kind of set in stone. So we always like to take our time with this process. 
um, we can potentially, potentially allow for an increased business use. So we have a rule of thumb that we have as far as allowing for a certain area to be uh, for, for business use. If there's an existing business use, but it's still very small and sideline in nature, we have the ability maybe to, to tweak that a little bit to add a, a, a little bit more area that can be used for a sideline business. Um, we don't go crazy with it, but it, again, it just shows the ability to be flexible with this, with some of these restrictions. Furthering res further restricting certain land used on properties, and then kind of the big one, and the one that that we um, kind of um, that, that changes really with every property um, is for future subdivision and dwelling rights. So <clears throat> while we're preserving a farm. Um, preserving a piece of property might might lead you to believe that it's going to be exactly the same way it was the day it was preserved. And while that's generally true, the general use of the property is going to be the same as it was the day it was preserved. Um, depending on the size and location of the property, and we do allow for future subdivisions to occur to support the the, the other uses on the property. For example, if it's a hundred acre farm. Um, we typically would allow that farm to be subdivided into another farm. So you could have two 50 acre farms, for example. So we want to allow that future subdivision to happen. Both of those 50 acre farms are still going to be preserved. They're still gonna have restrictions on them. They're still technically under that same original easement, but they're just owned and operated as separate pieces of land. Um, so we allow for that type of use to occur. Now that doesn't that doesn't happen on every case. <clears throat> we have some smaller pieces of property we've preserved too. We have you know small 10 acre farmettes that we've preserved. And in those cases, um, the negotiation ability of the landowners are are it's definitely less in those <clears throat> in those scenarios. We um, typically don't allow for any subdivision to occur under 25 acres. Our our rule of thumb, going back to bullet point number two, is we typically allow for one subdivision and one future house to occur per 25 acres of the original parcel. Um, that's kind of our rule of thumb uh, and we kind of go off of that um, and tailor the easement from there. We typically cap that at around that 100 acre mark so if we happen to get a 200 acre farm we're not going to allow eight houses to occur there. Um, so there's obviously some some gray area and we have some just some caps that we put on it but um, really the key point to take away here is that we have the flexibility to allow for for future subdivisions, but we have to decide for what those what what are we going to allow for before the farm is technically preserved. And we want to put some limits on that because otherwise, if we allow subdivision and and houses to be built kind of unrestricted, what are we really achieving as far as those conservation objectives are concerned? <clears throat> so. Bear with me here, this slide is a little bit kind of technical, but I just wanted to put it on here to show kind of how our easements are structured and, and how um, it, they can be kind of complex at times. So we have, I believe it's eight articles in our easement, <clears throat> all kind of broken down into different sections. So if you were to pull our document and, and it's around 24, 25 pages long, and you read through the whole thing, this is what you would see. And this is basically a table of contents for it. The first uh, article, Article 1, really just kind of sets the stage, gives the background on the property, where it's located, size, uh, talks about what the tax parcel number is, who the owner is, um, just kind of sets the background for the situation. What, what property are we talking about? Who are we talking about here? And you can see there, what, where's the property, who owns it, what are, what are the, uh, the objectives? So that's one thing I forgot to mention. In this article, we also outlined those five conservation objectives that I showed on that graph a few slides ago. Second article, right off the bat, we talk about, is any portion of this property built able to be subdivided? Is any portion able to be transferred separately from the rest of the farm? As I mentioned on the previous slide, that doesn't always, that's not always the case for every property. It depends on size, scale, location, but we want to put that forth so anybody pulling this knows, okay, they're allowed one subdivision of 10 or more acres from this property and one other future house, and that's it. 
we set that we set that forth and 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 what are the specific restrictions related to that subdivision and also we uh, put put um, requirements in there that the landowner has to contact us and let us know what they're planning and we have to approve it so it's not just it's not just that uh, that they can just go and do it <clears throat> from there we get into establishing what are the different levels of protection on this property first one being highest protection area next standard protection area and third or the fifth article, minim, minimal protection area. And I'm glossing over these now because we'll get into these in more detail in the future. Article six talks about rights and duties of holder. So the term holder in the, con in the context of our easement refers to Lancaster Farmland Trust. The landowner is granting that easement to us and we hold it and enforce it in perpetuity. And beneficiaries so we we establish you know we always there's always kind of a backup plan if for unfortunately and hopefully this never happens but in 100 years from now if lancaster farmland trust goes out of business um the easement's still going to be valid the easement's still going to be in place and who and establishing who the beneficiaries are of that easement. so how do we it sets forth in that article sets forth how do we plan to enforce this document what are we going what steps are we going to take to make sure that um the restrictive covenants are are still in place and the objectives are being met if in the unfortunate circumstance there were to be a violation of the easement we have an article that covers that covers our process covers what what our steps are going to be to remedy that violation we hope to never have to use this section, but inevitably um, it will happen probably at some point in the future. So it's good to have a plan. And Article 8 is kind of the miscellaneous catch-all section. This section includes a lot of reference to different uh, laws that are out there, policies that support farmland preservation, certain kind of um, things that are required by, by different acts and laws that have happened over the years. Um, that are, that really it's more of a legal uh, kind of covering our bases um, article. And in Article Nine, one of the most important um, sections of the easement, and actually something that we haven't had historically, uh, but we have now in the easement we use currently, is a glossary of defined terms. So any doc, any legal document, and and, and especially when it comes to conservation easements, they can tend to have some language that can be um, one person may define it differently than another person. For example, sustainable agriculture. <clears throat> what does that mean? What that means to one person can mean um, something completely different to another person. So we um, def we have a, a, a it's a two or three page glossary, and any term in our easement that's capitalized that triggers that that, that there is a defined term for that. So if if for whatever reason our easement would ever be called into a court case, um, it leaves a lot uh, less for interpretation because we set forth right in our glossary how we're defining certain terms in our easement. So it's really important um, to be able to rely on that. And it's clear for landowners too. You know, um, if, the, if, a, if we do our, if my staff, we do our job well and we are define and, and, and the landowner understands the easement, by the time he or she signs it, um, they can they know that if they have a question on their easement and it's a defined term, they can go back and look that up um, and they can feel empowered that way. So we're going to back up into the middle of this section here and talk about these different protection areas because these are the meat of the document. That's why I have that little stake there. Um, they're the kind of the, the 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 take off the most space physically in the document, but they're also um, arguably uh, some of the most important parts of the document too. So, along with our easement, we include what's called an easement plan. So this is a, a document that's recorded along with the easement at the it's recorded at the end, and it basically it's a map um that shows that defines certain areas on the property shows the e the overall easement boundary so um, a lot of times that's just the property boundary but in cases where there may have been a small area excluded from the easement area we would want that boundary to reflect that 
And then more importantly, it, it delineates different protection areas on the property. So you can see on the legend down here, I think most people should be able to see my mouse here. Um, you can see the green areas being highest protection areas, the red-ish areas being minimal protection areas, and then kind of the balance being standard protection areas. Um, so this is really important uh, to, to delineate where these areas are because there are certain uses and improvements that can and cannot occur within these particular areas. And this is just an example, example piece of property here that I pulled up. So we'll start off with the highest protection area. So we, if a landowner, um, and I'll start with the caveat that highest protection areas are not always going to be established on every piece of property we preserve. Um, and you'll, you'll see why, um, but not every single one of our farms are gonna have a land use that makes sense to go into a highest protection area, or, or maybe the landowner doesn't wish to place them in a highest protection area, but some will. So we like to have the ability to have it in there. So think about this land being kind of the, the, the top of the tier, the land that, is, um, th that, we, that you can do the least with, um, or that you want to do the least with, I should say, as far as improvements go. So let land left mostly to be untouched, being um, maybe forested tract, uh, a forested tract, an area around a, a, a stream called a riparian buffer, um, kind of protecting that stream corridor, or a natural area that's really kind of not cultivated, left open um, for, for wildlife, things like that. Future improvements in these areas are very minimal, what we allow for. We allow for very kind of minor improvement of trails. They, they cannot be covered in pavement, cannot be covered in, in even gravel. It really has to be either just, they're just, um, you really can't even tell they're there or that maybe at most covered in wood chips or something like that. We allow for hunting stands, um, maybe maybe other types of stands that would be used for research or something like that, um, fences to an extent. And then obviously we allow for and encourage conservation practices, habitat enhancement in these areas, because that's really what they're intended for. So you can make improvements as long as they're either having no impact on this highest protection area, or they're actually improving some of those conservation values in that area. So activities and uses so that are permitted, again, very minimal. Anything that existed prior to the, the farm or the property being preserved, those types of uses would be permitted. Now, if it was a use that doesn't make sense for this area, we likely wouldn't put it in the highest protection area anyway. So um, those uses aren't, aren't gonna be very invasive anyway. Um, we allow for cutting and managing of invasive species and other similar kind of resource management. Um, any sort of, it, you know, for example, if there's a tree that maybe is a safety hazard or something like that, a danger to um, the public or, or the, or the um, you know, uh, the, the private landowners, th those types of things can occur, but no clear cutting, no cultivating really of this land, um, nothing really like that. And then limited uh, intensity recreational uses. You can walk through the woods, you can walk along the stream, you can have horseback riding on those trails I mentioned, given that those trails aren't really improved that much. Um, nature study, hunting, fishing, research, those kind of things that don't really leave a footprint. <clears throat> and like I mentioned, they're not necessarily used, they're going to be used in every single one of our easements. <clears throat> the picture here on the right is, um, it's a picture of, of one of our farms and an area that I would envision being in a highest protection area. So going back to our example, the arrows here are pointing to what I have delineated as being highest protection areas. You have a nice wooded track along a stream, and then in my kind of scenario in my mind, the landowner planted a riparian buffer uh, along the stream, and we put that in the high, highest protection area as well. The next level down from highest protection area and, and the area that it is going to make up most of a preserved farm is the standard protection area. 
This is kind of the cream of the crop. Everything you think of when you think of reserve farm, it's our cropland and it's our pasture land. Um, and as you work your way down the scale, we allow for kind of more improvements to occur. Um, so I have some improvements can happen. We allow for agricultural improvements um, with a lemon. We allow for access drives. We allow for improvements for other permitted activities that are, so certain activities that are permitted that we'll cover below, improvements to support those activities are permitted. And then anything that was permitted within the highest protection area is obviously also permitted in the standard protection area. If a landowner chooses to, to um, plant a riparian buffer and never touch it again, and it's within the standard protection area, that's, that's great. Um, but there's nothing that necessarily restricts it, in, restricts, it, restricts it within the easement if it's not placed in the highest protection area, um, if that makes sense. The one catch is with a standard protection area is there is a limit on impervious surface coverage. So impervious surface coverage as defined in the easement in that glossary I mentioned would be anything that um, does not allow for stormwater to penetrate down into the ground. Um, and we define that as uh, any sort of building footprint, obviously a driveway, either whether it's paved or gravel, um, anything that also prevents kind of the cultivation of that land. So um, a lot of folks ask about the, um, you know, covering 40 acres of the farm in solar panels or something like that. Um, there, that land's not necessarily really available then for farming if, if, it, if it over that 2% is covered, covered in that. Uh, um, that may have not been the best example, but you get my point. Activities and uses. Um, so like I mentioned, any uses that were, were permitted in the highest protection area, or as we call it, HPA, um, those are permitted. But we also then allow for agriculture, agriculture to occur, forestry, generation of renewable energy for use on the farm. That's kind of a key point there. Um, so we're generating renewable energy to power the farm. That's different than uh, generating renewable, en renewable energy to be sold back to, onto the grid. Key distinction there. Um, and then recreational uses that are limited in size and frequency and do not require motorized vehicles and do not disturb soil. So a little bit more recreation can occur um, as long as it's not really messing with the ag operation um, and it's not, um, you know, anything that's a commercial use it, if it's not threatening those conservation values or conservation objectives, we're okay with it. So the picture on the right there shows a lot of crop land and some uh, pasture land on the left there, I believe. So that's that would be, in my mind, in the standard protection area. Back to our example, like I mentioned, kind of everything outside of the highest protection area and the minimal protection area would be in the standard protection area. Um, this map, this easement plan now, it doesn't show any buildings or anything within that standard protection area. Uh, the landowner can construct agricultural related improvements within the standard protection area. Just remember, there's a limit of 2% of that area can be under impervious surface. So it allows for some, but you'll see that, that, that why we don't include all of the buildings within that standard protection area, because it, would, it wouldn't be able to occur. And then lastly, we have our minimal protection area. Um, think about um, all of the uh, kind of clusters of buildings that occur on a farm. Typically, all the all the ag buildings are pretty clustered close together with a house or two um, in that kind of farmstead area. Those are kind of our minimal protection areas. So we allow for obviously what exists there today. We want to establish a minimal protection area around that. But where it gets a little bit unique is, if you remember back when I was talking about future subdivision allowances, if we're allowing for a future subdivision to occur, and, we, and the intent is for that to be a piece of land that can be subdivided and developed into another farm, we want to allow for some um, similar buildings to be able to go up there, basically. We want to allow for farm buildings and maybe another house to go up there, another set of farm buildings. So we have to, in our kind of uh, mind, have to uh, think, be thinking about that when we're drafting these easements, that we want to allow for potentially another minimal protection 
protection area. It gets a little bit kind of confusing, but in the easement, we would allow for the establishment of a future minimal protection area with some parameters. It can't, it can't just happen anywhere on the property. We have to set size limitations and it, it has to be within the standard protection area and, and certain things like that. Um, but anyway, within a minimal protection area, we allow for the most most of the improvements to occur and the least amount of restrictions um, compared to the other two protection areas. So this is where our residential uses are going to occur. So existing houses, and if we allow for maybe um, the house to be expanded from a single family home to a double family home, we see that pretty often on our, on our farms where we have multiple generations living together, we'll allow for residential uses um, with restrictions. We allow for small sideline businesses. The key takeaway there is that the business, um, it cannot take over at any point. It cannot take over the, it cannot become the main use of the property. Agriculture and, and the farming operation needs to be, it needs to be clear that that is still the, the main use of the property and the business is, is truly sideline in nature. Um, and then improvements for those types of uses, residential, the sideline business, ag improvements. As with the other two protection areas, anything that could occur within those protection areas can also occur within this minimal protection area. Um, and there's no limit on impervious surface coverage. So that's why we try to keep these areas relatively small and tight around the existing buildings with some a little bit of room for improvement because we don't you know, well, we don't want the whole farm to be paved over, so we don't want to put the whole farm in a minimal protection area. Um, and the kind of a key takeaway is that any use, while, while in the while it's in the minimal protection area, it's still a preserved farm, and it still is under that same easement. So any use <clears throat> still must not fly in the face of those conservation of objectives. Um, and our board is still going to review any sort of use that may not be. Um, it may not be clear whether it's permitted or not, um, and any sort of large scale commercial, um, you know, it's the whole reason we can't build a large uh, Walmart in the mineral protection area and can't build a, uh, an apartment complex because those uh, do not achieve the conservation objectives. So the picture there on the right shows a farm that we just preserved last year and then kind of its existing buildings. Um, so you can see this would likely you know this area and some of the some of the area around the buildings would be included in a minimal protection area. Back to my easement plan example, <clears throat> you can see I drew the red kind of box around the the existing improvements, and I did I you know I bumped it out a little bit into the fields, thinking um, giving want to give the landowner some. Um, ability to make further improvements to their buildings, maybe build an addition on their barn, maybe uh, you know build a, another pole barn or something back in here. Um, and, and really the goal is keep those buildings clustered together. So some quick kind of facts um, that are about our easement documents. So they are pretty lengthy. They're average about 24 pages. Um, some of that is is our kind of technical courthouse pages that um, signature pages and notary pages and things like that. Um, but the meat of the document still takes up a, a good chunk of that. In comparison to our first easement that we uh, that was granted to us in 1988, that one was only 10 pages. So <clears throat> as time has gone, um, as time as time has gone on, we have um, made updates to our template. Um, if you looked at our first easement compared in, comparing to our easement today, they are vastly different. Um, we learned things over the last 30 years and then we made changes to our easement to further protect us and, and, and more importantly, further protect the land and the landowner. I'd say it takes about six months from the time that we first meet with the landowner to go over our template easement to the day that we're signing and recording the easement. And through this time, we are our st our staff is is having those initial meetings with the landowner. We're literally scratching things out and writing writing what you know writing in the margins on our on our um, template easements on things we want to tweak and things we want to include. Um, we get that drafted up, 
to a point where we're comfortable with it. it might take a, a few weeks there. We send it to our attorney. Our attorney will review it, make recommendations, maybe bounce it back and forth a couple of times with our staff. Once we have a good um, copy from our attorney, we'll then send a copy to our landowners who then have the chance to review it with their attorney, their tax preparer, their family, uh, whoever. And then finally, we have a final review with the landowner at the time of settlement and we sign it and take it to the courthouse or in, in our case, Lancaster is afforded with online courthouse ability. So we record it at our desks at work. So all of that, typically about six months. When you're bouncing it around to a bunch of different uh, attorneys and things like that, it can take some time. So only as of 2019 did our easement include a glossary of defined terms. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and this is an estimate, but it, I, I believe I counted them all up. And I think that we've had less than 20 of our of our 513 easements have been amended in 32 years. So um, that just shows that we, we are very intentional about the way that we draft these and we don't like to um, change them and we really aren't able to change them. That's, that's really the bigger part. We're not able to change them unless um, there maybe was an error. Yeah, uh, we accidentally admitted a legal call in, in, a, in a legal description or something like that. Or um, if we wanted to amend an easement, this is the best case scenario, amend an easement to include more land that maybe a property owner acquires. So um, it, has to, it has to be an increase to, to those conservation objectives that we that I talked about. We can, we are, we're not permitted by the IRS to amend an easement to basically take away a restriction that exists. Now, amendment, amendments could probably be a whole webinar in and of themselves, so I won't go too far there. <clears throat> all right, uh, that's all the content I had. I know that was kind of a quick um, dumping of information. You could probably do a whole half day seminar on, on our easement, but I wanted to leave some time here for questions. So Jeff or Laura, I'll let you see if, see if there are any questions. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we did have one question that came through, uh, but I would encourage everyone, if you have additional questions, feel free to, to put them in the chat or the question panel. Uh, we had a, a question that came through um, asking about who provides legal counsel uh, for the trust and, and what's the relationship of that nature, whether it's in-house counsel, whether it's contracted. Um, so um, I'll, I'll take this one, Jeb, if you don't mind. Um, the trust uses Brubaker, Cognitin, Goss, and Lucarelli uh, in Lancaster for our general counsel. Um, Ted Brubaker in the firm has done um, most of our work, especially related to conservation easements, but then just you know overall guidance for the organization. Um, and and Ted um, has offered that service pro bono um, for many, many, many years. So we're very appreciative and and and, and thanks. Uh, his generosity to the trust. And then Jeb did mention um, pregnant law offices, um, and we con we contract with them for specialized services um, specific to, to easements. Okay, uh, a question came through. How do you view porous asphalt in relationship to impervious surface? It's a good question. I'll let, I'll let you take that one, Jeb. So that's a that's a, a good question, um, and that that's where that glossary of terms that I reference really really helps us there because I think it, you you'd find plenty of definitions out there that a porous pavement by definition rainwater can percolate can down through there, um, but our definition also includes an element of um, that that type of use would restrict certain um, uses that could occur if you were to put porous pavement somewhere for example you couldn't necessarily cultivate the land so it's the same reason um, that we count buildings that maybe have a dirt floor or but are covered um, uh, things like that so we still count them as uh, impervious surface even uh, and it's really because we have created our own definition in our in our glossary that defines what we're counting as impervious surface. So it's it's not only areas that are impervious by by definition of stormwater not being able to to 
go down through them, but also because those areas are not available for kind of other uses if you place a, a, a section of porous pavement on top of it. Good. Thanks, Jeb. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, can the government uh, claim eminent domain and override the easement for something like a road or a pipeline? Um, so <clears throat> the answer to that is is yes. Any uh, any entity, whether it be government, governmental, or in some cases that maybe you've read about in the newspaper in the past few years, we have a, when, when a private corporation has, is granted the ability of em, eminent domain, um, as you might uh, suspect, eminent domain kind of trumps everything, included including easements. Um, I will say though that. Um, we have never seen an entire farm or entire property condemned or taken by eminent domain. The cases that we see uh, most frequently are related to uh, road improvements, bridge improvements, things that really have demonstrated the public, uh, the need for public safety and health. Um, and in those cases, PennDOT or the township or whoever's doing that improvement um, would be condemning just a, maybe a tiny sliver of land on either side of the road. And in those scenarios, yes, that area is technically being removed from preservation, maybe a couple of thousand square feet. And then the landowner and actually the trust are both compensated accordingly uh, for the value of that lost, uh, that lo the lost value then by condemning that easement. Um, so I hope that kind of answers your question. And I'll just add to that, Jeb, there was, um, um, those on the webinar today may recall about two years ago there was a proposal by the Cumberland Valley School District up in Cumberland County to take a little over 100 acre preserved farm for um, expansion for I think it was a new middle school uh, and there was a lot of outcry by the community um, we did some advocacy work uh, as well in Harrisburg uh, and actually the legislature uh, proposed um, and it was signed into law um, a new provision that um, for anyone to condemn preserved land um, they have to actually go to, to orphans court um, it's just where sort of these um, public trust issues um, get discussed at uh, and they actually have to seek approval of the court before that they can take the land. So that was a great step in the right direction um, because school districts do have the ability to, of, of, of eminent domain and can take property. Um, and this particular law now places limitations uh, on, on specific government entities for, from the ability to do that. Another question that came through is, if a farm is subdivided as permitted by the original easement agreement, is a separate easement agreement required? Uh, so it's not required. Um, certainly, we um, have the ability, if and, and and really the trust discretion, if we feel um, that we need to, we we need to, we could amend the easement for the purposes of clarifying that that subdivision has occurred. Um, typically, we uh, tr uh, historically we haven't done that. Um, we if, if a subdivision, if a permitted subdivision is executed. We just recognize that the easement still covers both of those properties. With our with our kind of our newer easement and the one I covered today that we've started using the past few years, um, we do have the ability to kind of re, re um, to uh, amend and restate the easement to basically say that okay, the original easement allowed for that subdivision to occur. Now that subdivision has occurred, and no other subdivision uh, can happen moving forward. So. Um, to answer your question, yes, we can amend, but no, we we don't in every case. And Jeff, I think it's also important just to to mention um, in those subdivision plan notes. So there's notes on the subdivision plan. Um, there's a reference that states that the property is subject to the easement, and then as property transfers ownership to the next generation, or a farm is sold at public auction, and it, you know a new owner um, now has it. You know, we, we often get questions about, well, well, how does that person know that it's preserved? Um, and their deed, when they take ownership, has a reference in it that state that it's subject to a conservation easement and, and held by the trust. Uh, likewise, 
when we know a property is going to transfer ownership, we reach out to that new owner, or if a farm is going off for public auction, we try and be there at the day of the auction and you know weeks leading up to that, fielding questions from prospective buyers, because we want to make sure everyone's informed and aware that a property that they're they're considering to purchase is subject to an easement. Uh, so I'm not seeing any other questions right now. We'll give it another minute here or so to see if anyone has a, another question before we close today out. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions come through. So with that, um, would like to thank everyone again for your interest in this topic, and thank you for attending our webinars, especially for those uh, who have who have come back uh, multiple times. Uh, again, there will be a posting of the webinar on our YouTube page, and you can also go there to view any past webinars that the trust has has hosted. Uh, please be on the lookout for future topics. We do have webinars uh, scheduled out for the remainder of May, so. 11 o'clock every Wednesday, um, come back here. You can go to our website and find the details and uh, on each of those and what the topics are. So until we see you next week, thank you for your interest and we hope that you are all safe and well. Thank you. Thanks.